Well, good afternoon, um, everybody. My name is Simon Upton. I'm the uh, director of the environment team uh, here at the OECD. And uh, for our live green talk today, we have Dr. Shardul Agrawala, who heads up our environment and economy integration division to talk about the environmental impacts of widespread 3D printing. If there's a person in the uh, Environment Directorate who you can count on to be slightly ahead of the curve somewhere, it's Shadul. He has uh, spotted, I think, an extremely interesting topic, so much that's done on the next production revolution, where the world is going, is always looked at through uh, uh, techily optimistic eyes. Uh, and of course, there are lots of positive things to flow, but there will be environmental consequences. And not many people have asked those questions. So Shadul is going to talk for about 25 minutes on this topic. And then there's going to be roughly half an hour for questions. We're going to close off at 2 p.m. Just for those of you who aren't with us today, you can send questions at any time to Beth, who I believe you can see. Uh, send them in at any time, uh, and then I'll have the questions from you and from anyone in the room, and we can dig deeper into the subject. So, without any further ado, Shadul, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Simon, and good afternoon. Uh, this uh, talk that I'm going to give uh, came out of uh, a project that we've done in the OECD Environment Directorate, which was triggered by, by some questions uh, 3D printing was make, beginning to make a lot of news, and we were initially interested in two issues. One related to what might be some of the environmental consequences with regard to uh, transportation uh, changes that might result as a, uh, as a consequence of 3D printing, especially when we manufacture goods closer to uh, points of end consumption. The other issue was uh, something we were thinking about with regard to material use. Does 3D printing reduce material use? What are its implications with regard to waste? Uh, so those were some of the issues that motivated this project. It sort of morphed into something much more complex than that. And in parallel, uh, our colleagues in the Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation had a much broader project, which looked at the next production revolution and they had interest in the environmental consequences of the next production revolution. So this work that I'll present to you is a confluence of these two strands of interest in two parts of the OECD. So coming to the outline of my talk, uh, I'll, I'll be covering four issues. Uh, first, uh, 3D printing 101, what is 3D printing, briefly. And then I'll be talking a little bit about technologies, trends, and what might be some of the prospects according to industry insiders. Uh, with regard to 3D printing. I'll obviously focus a lot of my talk on uh, the potential environmental implications of 3D printing, and finally conclude with what role can policy play in enhancing the environmental sustainability of 3D printing. And the work that uh, I'll be presenting draws on a chapter which is co-authored with uh, Dr. Jeremy Faludi from University of California, Berkeley, my colleague Natasha Klein-Thomas and myself, which would appear in uh, an OECD publication, uh, which is on the next production revolution very shortly. So coming to 3D printing, most of you are probably vaguely or uh, much more familiar with it already. Uh, it's it, The more technical term is additive manufacturing, and it's a set of technologies and processes that use a digital file to build a product, a physical three-dimensional object. Uh, so that's one example of a, a CAD file, a computer-aided design file. And this object is made by adding or printing layers of material until the model is, a, is, uh, is, is, is complete. Now, in terms of uh, what kinds of machines, what kind of printers. Uh, there's a wide variety of printers. Some of them might be slightly bigger than your desktop printer, but a lot of them might be bigger than refrigerators. And they use different materials. They have uh, different applications. 
so, so there's a wide variety of uh, um, uh, equipment that's out there which goes under 3D printing. Now, what are some of the common 3D printing technologies? Uh, again, there's a huge range of technologies. I'll just cover uh, four of the most common technologies. One of them is called stereolithography. And here, uh, UV uh, light is, a uh, UV laser is focused on photopolymers which harden uh, when exposed to UV light. And, and, and the project uh, and, and, the, and the product slowly hardens and is made layer by layer. Uh, then another technology is selective layer sintering. And here a laser is directed uh, at uh, metal powder as well as other uh, powders. And the heat of the laser uh, welds together the material and, and that ultimately leads to uh, the creation of the product. Uh, a third technology is uh, fused deposition modeling. And here, uh, a plastic filament or another input source of plastic is melted in a heated nozzle. And then it is deposited uh, on, on the three dimensions, uh, layer by layer. And here you see uh, a plastic table being fabricated by a 3D printer. And, and finally, you have uh, inkjet printers. and the notion of inkjet 3D printing is very similar to the inkjet printers you used to at home or the office. But instead of ink, what you have is a binder. And instead of your paper, which you're printing on, what you have is powdered material. And the binder falls on a, a bed of powder layer by layer, and the binder uh, hardens the material. So that's a very simplistic introduction to some of the technologies that go into 3D printing. Now, obviously, when we talk about things like environmental implications of 3D printing, uh, the question is compared to what? And uh, again, there are a number of conventional manufacturing technologies which are in place, but the two uh, most obvious ones which 3D printing is currently already replacing or might replace in the future are machining, which uh, starts with a block of material and cuts away unwanted matter, and injection molding, where uh, you heat up thermoplastics and then they, through a pressured nozzle, they are uh, directed to a mold uh, to where, where they harden and produce the object. Now, machining is typically used for prototyping, and injection molding is uh, used much more for mass production. But these are the technologies that 3D printing uh, would be uh, competing to replace. So what about trends and prospects uh, of, of 3D printing? One thing that surprised me, at least when I started looking into it, was uh, that 3D printing has been around for close to three decades now. Uh, the first application of 3D printing was in Japan in 1981. Some of the earliest patents of 3D printing came out of France in 1984. And, uh, and, and later on, uh, the, the technology s sort of took off. The real widespread public awareness uh, took hold uh, in the early 2000s. And that was probably a combination of two factors. First, uh, the early patents expired, and that led to more widespread application. The other issue is obviously the convergence of these developments in 3D printing with progress in ICTs and digitization, and, and that would uh, probably contribute to the scale up of the applications of 3D printing. Now, between 2005 and 2011, there's been a very rapid growth. The number of 3D printers sold doubled, and uh, it's, uh, according to some estimates, it's a $2.2 billion market already, and projected to grow at least 20% per year over the next five to 10 years. Now, 3D printing is already being used for a wide range of applications. And if you follow news stories, you must have seen quite a few examples of, of things which have been 3D printed of late. To make some sense of where the developments are occurring, we map some of the examples along two dimensions. So first, we're talking about the nature of the product are these uh, so 
the, the first category I have is intermediate products or parts. And uh, the second category is end products. And then on the horizontal axis, uh, we're trying to divide the examples in terms of proof of concept or things which are on the market. So in terms of proof of concept and in the category of intermediate products or parts, uh, one example is custom fabrics. Another one which uh, could be hugely influential uh, in, in the coming years and decades is, is what is called bioprinting. We have the capacity to print living cells in a three-dimensional structure using some of these technologies and preserve cell functions. That's the key. And it's already being used for tissue, uh, generating tissue, and eventually to, 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 to produce organs. And, and so there's a, uh, there's a wide open frontier of possibilities in, in bioprinting. In terms of end products, which are again, more proof of concept at this stage, here is an example from Amsterdam where uh, a canal house is being 3D printed. Uh, and, and this project started, it's a demonstration project and started, uh, I think a year ago, and it's going to continue for uh, another couple of years, but, but this, is, uh, this is ongoing. Uh, another example, which many of you might have seen, is uh, the Strati electric car, which is uh, made out of a partnership by a, a new auto company called Local Motors, and one of the national labs in the United States, the Oak Ridge National Laboratories. <laughs> this electric car, the car was not printed as one object, it was obviously uh, printed in parts, but the printing took just 44 hours, and then it took another three days of milling, and, and, and that's the, the, the final product. Uh, if you talk about things which are 3D printed and on the market, uh, there's a lot that's happening in terms of rapid prototyping. Uh, the example that uh, you see on the screen are parts for Mercedes-Benz trucks, uh, which are 3D printed. Then there are examples of drone parts, for example, also. And then if we talk about end products, uh, one of the areas, uh, one of the most famous examples so far is the GE jet engine nozzle. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more. Uh, this uh, is already uh, in uh, aircraft now, and, uh, and it has uh, some interesting properties which, uh, which bear upon the environmental dimension, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, then 3D printing is also being used for medical devices like customized hearing, uh, hearing aids, uh, jewelry, and, and, and so on. Uh, so that's the spectrum of applications. Obviously, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of other products which are being 3D printed. Now, the main point to take here is that currently 3D printing is primarily producing prototypes, models, and tooling. Only 15% of 3D printed products are actually in sold goods. Uh, now, this trend might uh, change over time. And in fact, 3D printing is already making inroads into manufacturing. And in some sectors, it's growing as much as 60% per year. So, so it's a very rapidly evolving area. Now, in terms of expected evolution of which industries my 3D printing penetrate. Um, I already mentioned that the projected market growth is uh, expected to be 20% uh, per year. Now, the reduction in 3D printing costs is going to be a key determinant, and also the improvement in quality. Those factors are uh, going to play a role in terms of how fast this penetration occurs and where. So today, 3D printing is used largely in high cost, low volume industries and aerospace uh, is, is, is one of the examples. Uh, the next frontier is moderate cost, moderate volume industries. And sometime in the distant future, we might see penetration into low cost and high volume industries. So some of the examples of what's happening today, prototypes, aerospace, medical supplies, uh, we expect it'll move into precision machinery, optics, toys, and maybe go into designer housewares, furniture, clothing, and, and, and so on. Now, what are the factors on which this evolution might depend upon? Uh, we think uh, that it depends upon how quickly 3D printing can 
uh, expand the portfolio of materials that could be 3D printed. Uh, already, uh, there's been a significant diversification in materials, but another factor is that 3D printing to a large extent is still printing <coughs> single materials. And as we improve the capability to print composites, uh, that would considerably diversify the applications. Uh, print quality is another factor. Uh, also, the size range. Uh, I've already given examples, uh, in, uh, you know, examples of the two extremes. I mean, from bioprinting, which is at the level of cells and tissues, to a canal house. Uh, but uh, the diversity of sizes and how uh, viable it is in an operational sense is going to determine how quickly and where 3D printing might penetrate. It also depends upon how quickly the costs decrease and print time, uh, which is a, a key bottleneck, especially when we are thinking about uh, applications with regard to mass production. And of course, there are plenty of trade-offs between these parameters. Uh, so one, if you, if you focus on print speed, for example, uh, print speed and print quality often have an inverse relationship, as you might know from first-hand experience with your own printers. Uh, another uh, issue is print size. Uh, then uh, print speed, uh, the slower the speed, uh, the higher the cost, and the lower the volume of production. Uh, with regard to material choice, um, currently a lot of printer manufacturers are using a razor and blade model. So they provide, uh, you know, the printers are at a lower cost, but then you have to use proprietary materials. And uh, there are obviously a lot of DIY hobbyists who are using their own materials and, and their active websites, which discuss what materials to use. Uh, another thing related to materials choice uh, relates to the toxicity, uh, the potential toxicity of the materials, particularly at higher temperatures. Uh, then whether we can uh, use multiple materials at the same time and uh, recyclability of materials. And there, there is a trade-off because if we start printing more and more uh, products with multiple materials, it might actually cut down significantly on recyclability. So uh, there is a trade-off between uh, the potential for greater use and what it might mean from a recyclability point of view. So now let me come to environmental implications of 3D printing. There are a number of issues one needs to think about carefully before we answer this, uh, this, this question that I posed in my talk, what are the environmental implications of 3D printing? Uh, first, we need to be clear about what is our unit of analysis. Are we talking about 3D printing as a manufacturing process, or we're talking about the products that 3D printing is producing? And the implications for the environment are very different depending upon what we're talking about. When we are talking about 3D printing processes, another issue is, are we talking in the aggregate? That is the widespread application of 3D printing going to have a net environmental impact or not? Or are we talking about individual processes? What if you manufacture a certain part using a certain 3D printing technology? Here we are getting into life cycle assessment and uh, if you're talking about aggregate, then we need to know how much the, uh, this technology will penetrate and where and what technologies it would replace. Another uh, factor when uh, considering environmental implications at the process level is uh, the, the nature of the inputs, the materials that are used, the energy that is used and so on and also the byproducts, uh, both in terms of other any emissions of harmful substances or uh, waste that is generated. When we're talking about products, uh, does 3D printing uh, lead, to, uh, lead us to produce more easily products which might have certain characteristics in terms of weight, in terms of complexity of design, and also in terms of their end of life? So these are the parameters that come into play when we start talking about the environmental implications of 3D printing. And, and to emphasize again, uh, there's nothing which is absolute here. Everything is relative to the counterfactual. So if you're talking about process, we have to compare 3D printing to machining or injection molding. When we're talking about products, again, we have to compare 3D printing to products which could have been produced through the existing technologies. 
So let me first give you a couple of green applications uh, which address different uh, components of the product or the process. Uh, this is uh, an example from General Electric where jet engines with 3D printed parts uh, were successfully tested and in fact GE has supplied uh, jet engines which contain uh, uh, a number of 3D printed nozzles to Airbus and that delivery occurred six months ago. Uh, FAA has given licenses to jets with 3D printing nozzles. Uh, so, so this is uh, very much operational. So this is the Leap jet engine which has 19 3D printed fuel nozzles. They're 25% lighter than the alternate and 15% uh, more fuel efficient. So there are clear implications uh, in terms of fuel consumption, uh, energy use, and, and obviously greenhouse gas emissions. Then uh, there are some niche examples. Of, uh, and, and here I have two examples, energy efficient walls and rhino horns, which are uh, very different cases. This is a, a 3D printed wall, which includes insulation, uh, all the piping and everything, and, and it's a very uh, thin wall and it has very good uh, properties in terms of insulation and so on. And uh, the potential mass production of such walls could, could reduce uh, domestic household energy consumption. This is a 3D printed rhino horn, and this is a company which uh, is a biotech company which was able to replicate genetically this, uh, you know, it's genetically the exact material which is there in rhino horns, and then it's 3D printed to produce rhino horns. And the logic here is to these these horns can be made much more cheaply, but they are genetically identical and visually look the same. And the idea is to flood the market with these cheaper rhino horns to essentially crash the price, so that there would not be incentive for poaching. So. Once the technology is there, I think it's uh, and it's so decentralized and accessible, people will come up with ideas which can have a wide range of uh, implications which we cannot uh, envisage. And, and these are just some of the examples which have uh, a green twist to them. Now, coming back to some of the questions that motivated this work, uh, we had thought uh, naively that uh, 3D printing could potentially reduce the costs and externalities, environmental externalities related to transportation. And the idea we had was if we are producing goods uh, closer to the point of end consumption, then there might be a reduction in transportation. And that is not uh, the case, uh, and, and I'll get into the reasons uh, in a minute. Uh, and we also had this hypothesis that it may improve, uh, uh, it may reduce waste generation and, and improve waste management. And here the picture is a lot more mixed, but I'll get into that. So one of the key points, and I think I've been emphasizing it throughout my talk, is the environmental implications of 3D printed parts are highly context specific, depending upon the printer type, the part geometry, machine utilization rate, and so on. So it's very hard to draw generalizations. It's also dependent on the counterfactual, which technology is it replacing. Now, to give a typical example of a 3D printed hollow shell plastic or metal part, uh, life cycle assessments have been done by our co-author, uh, Professor Dr. Faludi, and uh, they've shown that the, uh, 3D printing this part has lower environmental impact than machining, but higher impact than injection molding. But again, it's very context specific, depends upon the part, depends upon uh, the, uh, the printer used and so on. So uh, again, one has to be very cautious making generalizations. Now, one important thing to note is that when we are talking about machining versus 3D printing, the, the environmental impacts of machining are dominated by material use, obviously, because you're chipping away material to produce the product. In the case of 3D printing, it's the energy use which is the, the, the dominant vector in terms of the environmental impacts. And if you're talking about uh, future evolution of 3D printing, uh, it is expected that 3D printing will replace machining 
uh, more progressively uh, compared to injection molding, which is used much more for ma mass production. But machining is a very small part of manufacturing. And, and so we don't expect aggregate environmental impacts to be uh, significantly altered, at least in the near term. Now, coming to transport. Uh, so why would not 3D printing uh, reduce the environmental externalities of transport? Several points here. First, as I mentioned, 3D printing doesn't produce finished products to a large extent. It produces, at best, parts which might go into products. You still need to, to manufacture a number of other parts which might go into a final product, which may not be 3D printed. And then there obviously uh, assembly needs to be done and so on. So it's not as straightforward that we are printing very complex product uh, directly. Uh, one place where 3D printing may reduce some of the environmental externalities is if there, if a firm or a company has to produce a number of products which use the same material input, say a metal alloy. So you can think of an auto parts company which uses one metal alloy and now they don't have to uh, have a lot of parts transported and stored. They can just store the alloy and print on demand. And, and, and there may be some, uh, some benefits there. But uh, another point is that even if uh, 3D printing were to reduce uh, the environmental impacts uh, from transport in the aggregate, for the manufacturing process, the environmental impacts from transport are a relatively small share uh, of the overall environmental impact. So, so again, it's a question of uh, how, how much it will matter in the big picture. And even if we have products which are manufactured close to final consumption, we now have a decentralized setup where feedstock would need to be transported to all these settings. Coming to material use. Um, 3D printers uh, started with plastics, uh, but they already use a wide range of materials, uh, metals, ceramics, paper, food, starch, salt, living cells. Uh, so it's already quite uh, diversified in terms of the nature of products. Now, historically, uh, the, the dominance of plastics in the manufacturing process was to a large extent because it could be easily shaped into uh, various forms uh, to, to, to suit different products. Now, 3D printing does, to a certain extent, offer the potential to have plastic-like properties in a broader range of products. So in that sense, there may be uh, some benefit if uh, it shifts uh, certain uh, manufacturing away from, uh, from, from plastics. Uh, but a lot of materials that are used currently, because there are no specific policies which are focusing on the green dimension, when the market forces are determining what feedstock is being used. And many of the materials that are being used are actually not, they don't classify as environmental improvements right now. Uh, for example, a lot of 3D printers use metal powder uh, compared to uh, conventional manufacturing, which would use metal ingots. <clears throat> metal powder is much more energy intensive to produce. So, uh, so the, you know, under business as usual, it's not going to be the case that we're going to move to a, a trajectory which is going to be more environmentally beneficial. Now, where could uh, the material use go, especially with the help of policy? Uh, their uh, biodegradable materials is, is certainly one area. Um, now, another trend that is already beginning to happen is using mul uh, multiple materials uh, to, to make one part. Now, that might diversify the applications of 3D printing, but it makes recycling even more of a challenge. So, so this is one thing that uh, one needs to, to, to bear in mind. There's a lot of talk right now on what are called tunable materials, which are capable of changing physical properties according to the printing parameters. And uh, there may be possibilities to have some of these uh, tunable materials, which are also made from materials which are abundant, not scare, non-toxic, and, and might be compostable or recyclable. So uh, there's, uh, this is an area where uh, there's a lot of activity which is currently going on. Now, waste generation. Waste in 3D printing is determined by printer type and the material input. Uh, 
also, uh, it's not the case that 3D printing is zero waste because most products require a lot of support material uh, in addition to the desired product. They also use cartridges and other material. And so a polyjet 3D printer wastes 43% of all its liquid polymer in both model and support material. Then there's the question of uh, overproduction and waste. And, and here we have two opposing trends on uh, in terms of generating less waste uh, if we have 3D printing facilitates leaner production, and that might reduce the incentives to mass produce and stock. Uh, it might, uh, 3D printing can also optimize geometry with lightweight parts. So that uh, could contribute to uh, reduced waste generation. On the other hand, uh, because 3D printing is a lot easier, uh, it might lead to uh, printing new models for testing uh, and, and induce demand for more fun desktop printing. So this is uh, analogous to the rebound effect in a way because it's just so easy and, and that might contribute to more waste generation. Waste management, uh, 3D printing does not automatically encourage recycling of materials, uh, but uh, there are initiatives. The, the, the 3D printer that you see there is, uh, is one which can use PET bottles to produce uh, filaments, uh, which could be used uh, as, a, 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 no, this is, uh, this is not a 3D printer. It's, it, it's an equipment which can, be, uh, which can use PET bottles to produce filaments for 3D printers. So here is one opportunity to close the loop in the material cycle. Uh, but again, uh, there are other possibilities and researchers are working on it, bioplastics, wood fiber, starch, uh, but even when we talk about bioplastics, we have to talk about waste management facilities because composting PLA bioplastic uh, requires investment in high temperature municipal scale facilities. So public policy really needs to uh, keep up with, with, with all these developments in, in 3D printing. Energy use. I already mentioned that when we look at the life cycle of environmental impacts, 3D printing, uh, for 3D printing, they're dominated by energy use during the printing process. And currently, there is no incentive for printer manufacturers to design energy efficient printers. Uh, there are no eco labeling schemes or uh, procurement programs and so on. And this is one area where uh, we signal a high policy priority. On the other hand, when we are talking about the product itself, uh, 3D printing could use energy, uh, could reduce mm -hmm. energy consumption. That was the case of the GE jet engine nozzle. So because 3D printing can enable the printing of more complex designs, it can uh, enable lighter products, which would be uh, consuming uh, less energy, but also with better fluid dynamic properties and heat transfer and so on. So, so there are there is a lot of potential to reduce energy consumption of the actual product through 3D printing technologies. Toxic exposure. This is something uh, that uh, is, is a key concern because there are workplace uh, health and uh, environmental health and safety standards, but when you're moving manufacturing to the household, uh, the same standards uh, do not exist. And uh, we have DIY hobbyists who are uh, using a lot of uh, chemicals and materials at high temperatures uh, with, without adequate safeguards. This is uh, the only scientific study that I could find, uh, which came out in a fairly respectable journal, Environmental Science and Technology, which, I'm um, sorry, you can't read the print, but it shows that uh, the exposure to some of the harmful uh, chemicals and particulates is actually high in poorly ventilated environments. And, and, and that is a key issue both in, in households, but also in small offices and so on. Uh, this is a quote from a professor of engineering. These 3D printers are like tiny factories in a box. We regulate factories. We would never bring one into our home. Yet we are starting to bring these 3D printers into our homes like they're toasters. <laughs> so this puts the, uh, the policy predict predicament quite, quite clearly. Um, then another area which, again, we had not thought of when we started is, and, and here there's a clearly environmentally beneficial aspect, is 3D printing could be used to extend the useful life of legacy products, particularly white goods. 
And I speak from personal experience because I had a washing machine and a small part broke down and I could not find the part. And that is something 3D printing is, is actually quite ideally suited uh, to, to, to do. And so if premature disposal of these uh, uh, white goods and other consumer goods could be delayed, then the environmental benefits of 3D printing could be quite significant. So that is the washing machine nub, which, uh, which I was referring to. But there are obviously issues with uh, intellectual properties and uh, IP infringement because the designs are obviously proprietary to the manufacturers. And this is an example from Australia where you have this blender and the small cap at the top of the blender was lost, so it's 3D printed. The reason it's a different color is somehow you can uh, actually get past the IP restrictions. Uh, a variant of that is to actually have a lemon squeezer at the top. Uh, so, so, so there are workarounds, but but I think public policy needs to confront this issue uh, in in terms of are there models where the manufacturers or the owners of the designs could get some small royalty, but uh, then they could make the designs available so that if there's a breakage of small parts, then they could be printed on demand. And there are business models which are emerging. This is a website called 3D Hubs, where you can upload your design, you can select a material that you want, and, and then you can, depending upon your location, you can find what the nearest facility is where they might print your design on demand, and, and, and you can order the material. Now, we've talked a lot about technology, but a key factor which is obviously going to play an important role when we talk about environmental implications is how do we as individuals and as a society respond to these transformative technologies? And now one can argue that if you have fabricated your own product, you'll be much more attached to it, so you might be less likely to get rid of it as quickly. And, and maybe that might extend the useful life of products. And so that's one argument that 3D printing could potentially uh, increase uh, the, the, the useful life of products. Although I wonder, because you might be producing a lot of products you don't need just because you have a printer sitting at home. Uh, and that's the other issue, ease and low cost printing, print more than necessary, uh, test out different models throughout most of them. And, and this is a nice summary again from somebody who follows 3D printing is 3D printing could herald the hypothesis, uh, no, apotheosis of con consumerism, instant gratification with throwaway society, or it could be at the heart of a whole new model of sustainable consumption. Which one of these comes to pass will be determined in large part by how we apply the technology. So those are, uh, that's a survey of the many uh, possible environmental implications of 3D printing. Where do we see a role for policy right now? Now, 3D printing is a technology that is just coming of age and is beginning to spread quite widely. The, there isn't as much lock-in and the interests are not as entrenched. So this is the time to, to tweak uh, through, through policy choices and investment choices the direction in which this technology evolves so that we end up with an outcome which is more environmentally sustainable than not. And if we have to go in that direction, what is it uh, that we can do? Uh, first thing is, there is a need for policies to encourage low energy printing processes. And uh, things like echo labeling and so on are uh, definitely uh, you know, uh, a first recommendation. But also we need to have policies for low impact materials with useful end of life. The market by itself is not going to lead us in that direction. We also need to target research and investment in these directions. Uh, government funded research has played a key role in the development of 3D printing. And, and, and so uh, directed research at environmental sustainability of 3D printing definitely has an important role to play. Um, policies can also include voluntary certification schemes for 3D printers, potentially combined with uh, preferential purchasing programs. Uh, and then uh, coming back to the example of legacy products and spare parts, here uh, the intellectual property issues need to be dealt with uh, to facilitate the possibility of, of, of printing spare parts. And finally, we need policy frameworks 
to assess and address the potential environmental health and safety implications of 3D printing. So that's all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Shadul. It's fascinating. So um, questions. I'm um, uh, Niels Axel. Um, you might like to say who you are, where you're from, and if you've got any that have come in, please uh, let me know. Thank you, Shadul, for an interesting presentation. My name is Niels Axel Bratton, also working in the Environment Directorate. You, you made some references to rebound effects, but my impression is that you don't fully take uh, general equilibrium consequences into account. For instance, in the example, uh, you, you, you referred several times to ben environmental benefits related to extended product life uh, period. But that overlooks the general equi equilibrium effect. When you were able to uh, print your part that saved you buying a new uh, washing machine, you saved money. But I, my assumption is that there is some sort of a budget constraint also in, in your family. So the money you saved there had implications for what else you would buy for your family. Or if you had had to buy a new washing machine, you might have spent less on something else. And all these indirect impacts need to be taken into account if you are to say something meaningful about the environmental impact. And um, the GE example that you gave, helps to make airplanes cheaper to build, which will have an impact on the prices of aviation, which will send more tourists to the Seychelles for their uh, winter weekends. So uh, you have, I, I feel there's a lot lacking in, in, in the argumentation here. Thank you. Thanks for that question. In fact, the money we saved uh, not buying a new washing machine, we flew to Barcelona. No, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, uh, no, uh, I, I think, I mean, ultimately, to uh, to do a more serious analysis, yes, you, you have to look at what you would do with money that you wouldn't have spent, uh, you would have spent uh, in the alternate scenario. Um, it's... I, I still think that, uh, I mean, there is no easy answer. I think you'll have to look at, uh, to examine these general equilibrium effects. You, you, you have to look at the specific case and, and you need to have proper models in terms of how, uh, you know, what you would do with the disposable income and so on. So I can't give you, uh, you know, a very clear answer here. But I think when you're talking about white goods in particular, they are, uh, they are necessities in households. And so it's not that we had disposable income lying around to, uh, you know, when a washing machine breaks down, you have to buy a replacement. Now, if you save on that, it's not necessary that we would spend the money on the next luxury trip or uh, do, do, do something. So but it's a longer discussion. I, mean, I think the point is well taken. I talked about the first order behavioral responses, and you're talking about the second order effects. But one assumes, Neil Zaxel, you'd be saying that you have to be thinking about the, the real concern, which is the environmental externality, and pricing that ensures that he doesn't rebound into Barcelona trips. I must say, it must have been a very expensive bit of <laughs> <laughs> washing machine if that was in play. Uh, other other questions? Yes, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Javier from the Chilean delegation. M my question is, uh, if there is a real case uh, taking all you shown in uh, showed uh, all the aspect uh, to a significant reduction in material consumption, um, 
I think material consumption is a great issue for environmental sustainability. We have the recent report of OECD that the material consumption will double uh, from now to 2050. And I think personally that is impossible to reach uh, Paris uh, agreement with this rate of uh, material consumption. If we combine um, less material in that machining, this uh, gains in efficiency in uh, produces 3D printing and another feature you mentioned that replacement part. And so do you think there is a real and uh, real case and what should be the policies to, to reach this uh, uh, decoupling of material consumption from uh, economic growth? Thank you for that question. It's It's again, I think the picture I was trying to paint was that it is such a diverse field with uh, very different technologies, scales, materials, and so on. It's, it's very hard, I think, and it's also very dynamic right now. It's very hard to uh, come to very, uh, very firm conclusions right now. Now, you're talking about material consumption. There are some examples where certain material loops have been closed. Uh, especially when uh, material which would have been waste is used as, as feedstock for 3D printing. So you might close certain loops in a small way. But uh, but again, that has to be, uh, that's a very small part of the picture. And even for feedstock, you need high purity feedstock. So you get into quality and sorting issues, which are the same challenges that recycling facilities face. So it's it's very hard even there to, 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 to make a very firm statement. Uh, but then you, you do have the, the issue of behavioral responses where you might actually end up, uh, especially if you're fabricating all kinds of plastic products, just because you have a printer, you might end up increasing your material consumption. So I think, uh, and this gets back to the discussion we just had in the question by Niels Axel, I, uh, there is a role for policies. I think they need to be uh, appropriate uh, price, price signals, certainly. Uh, but there also needs to be much more uh, public investment and, and R&D. It's not just a question of the volume of materials, it's a question of the type of materials. And uh, the environmental impact of the different materials that are used are very different. So how to direct uh, uh, the, the research in this area and, and how to direct the applications or induce the applications which go towards materials which are less scarce, less toxic, more recyclable or compostable and so on. I'm, uh, I'm Peter Borky, also with the Environment Directorate. Um, well, thanks for a really fascinating presentation. I, I, have, I have a couple of thoughts really on, on, on what you said about um, the sort of material dimension um, of, of 3D printing. Um, one thought that I had is, um, you know, 3D printing is probably going to lead to more decentralized production. Um, and if production becomes more decentralized, then um, it makes the logistics of material recovery more complex and um, makes it look maybe a little bit more similar to um, material recovery from municipal waste and consumer waste. Um, so, so which would be a disadvantage to a more centralized production model in uh, in, in, in factories, um, you know, which produce stuff at, at large scale. The other thought that I had um, is uh, about material substitution. So. Um, because what, what you can imagine is um, that, and I, I'm not sure you said anything about that in your presentation, but different um, 3D printers which use different types of materials um, are going to have different costs and they are going to be, uh, you know, there are going to be differences in the effectiveness with which they produce um, a certain, I mean, certain parts in, in terms of their physical properties. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, might, and, and maybe plastics is sort of the easiest and the lowest cost, might there be a substitution away from, from certain materials into plastics and possibly plastics that have a lot of 
um, you know, hazardous substances contained in them, additives, etc. I'm not sure if that is something at all that you were able to to look at in the report, but it, you know, it it it, it might be something to reflect on as well. Thanks, Peter. I, I, I mean, you are the waste management and resource efficiency expert. I, I completely agree with what you said uh, with regard to your first point that uh, decentralized manufacturing can uh, can uh, can considerably aggravate uh, waste management uh, and, and, and recovery challenges. Uh, with regard to your second point, um, it's it's quite interesting actually with regard to plastics. Uh, and I'm not a plastics expert, but the market forces have sort of moved in the direction that uh, at least the desktop 3D printers that are used in homes are using uh, PLA uh, plastics uh, much more than ABS. And uh, and, and, and PLA, uh, I think, uh, I mean, they, that is determined mainly by the physical properties at high temperatures of these plastics. And it just happens to be the case. There was no policy there. But uh, what I've been told, uh, and uh, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that PLA might be, uh, of the two of them, PLA might be uh, much better in terms of uh, the, the environmental properties. Uh, so it, this is one case where uh, the, you know, just the way the market is evolving, at least for desktop printing, the the kind of plastics that that are being used are uh, you know more environmentally friendly within coats than than, than the alternate but uh, is there a shift uh, towards plastic relative to other materials i i don't know i think data is very hard right now and it's a very rapid uh, rapidly evolving area right now but uh, i think this would need to be looked at systematically Thank you very much, uh, Jan Schuyer, uh, Global Relations Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Shadu. Fascinating presentation. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, I can imagine that there, are, especially with this uh, decentralization of production, there will be major implications for regulations for enforcement mechanisms, uh, right? Uh, Maybe more difficult actually to enforce uh, government reg uh, environmental uh, regulations. And my question is how far have governments actually? Um, moved in, in 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 the right direction. How much uh, thought have they given to this uh, to this subject? The implications of this kind of printing, if it becomes much more wide widespread. Uh, second, just a comment uh, on these these rhino horns. Uh, that that's an interesting thought. That this might have actually discourage uh, the, the 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 hunting of the, of the real animals. But part of the belief seems to be that um, the horns of rhinos bred in captivity doesn't work whereas only the wild variety is extremely effective, as everybody knows. Thanks uh, for those questions, Jan. Uh, on uh, governments, uh, you know, formulating policies or regulations to, to address, uh, you know, potential issues with regard to 3D printing, I don't think, uh, we, we haven't done a systematic review, but, uh, based on uh, the consultations we had, we don't think, I think it's always the case that policy is lagging uh, developments, especially when the technological developments are so rapid. So, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, even with regard to basic things like energy consumption, we, we, we don't have uh, the frameworks in place to incentivize uh, the manufacturer of printers with, uh, uh, which are more energy efficient. So I, I don't think uh, there are uh, too many examples right now of policies uh, which are uh, formulated in response to, to the challenges. There is interest uh, among policymakers. Uh, uh, for example, uh, I, I talked, uh, I've made this presentation to, to a committee where we have uh, regulators from uh, the chemicals management side and they have a lot of interest in the potential implications and they want to do a more serious assessment of what might be the exposure and so on uh, under different conditions. So there's interest in further studying the issue. I'm not sure we've reached the policy stage. Um, on, on rhino horns, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, this, this example actually provoked a heated debate among 
conservationists, mm. and not all conservationists are fans of this idea uh, for, for, for a whole multitude of reasons, mm. But, mm. but maybe we can pick that up offline. And I assume it's like it's like synthetic diamonds. There's value in the authentic thing. So you just put the price up further. Um, one more question. Uh, we've got five minutes left from uh, Andrew. Thank you, I'm Andrew Prague from the Environment Directorate. And I was a little bit involved with this work at the beginning, so uh, been been away from it for a long time. So it's very interesting to listen to the presentation in this. A couple of things struck me. I'm listening to it again. One is around the policy measures. A little bit like what you're just saying, but it. it struck me that it's, there's not so much a need for thinking of where do we need to create policies and regulations for 3D printing, but where does this new production technique fit into existing policies and regulations and how do they update this, like the energy use thing, the energy standards and labelling and even uh, on extended produce responsibility for, for waste and that kind of constant battle against planned obsolescence. How do you influence designers to be a more material efficient, whatever, or integrating these kind of concerns to that. But the second point is uh, you, what you mentioned briefly about the potential for design changes on building design, make it more airtight, actually walls made designed to be energy, incorporate, energy efficient, incorporating all the machinery of the wall and everything. And it struck me there that there's, there's really a huge potential in uh, eliminating these materials which we know are he heavily carbon intensive in their production steel cement construction materials and that they're trying trying to analyze where a rollout of these kind of technologies for replacing such uh, intense and old-fashioned materials would would be a really interesting area of future research so i guess it's not really a question but uh, those two things struck me in listening again well, thanks for, for for both those points i completely agree with your first point on on the second actually this how far would 3d printing uh, penetrate in uh, you know architecture and building construction that's one of the big questions i mean there are obviously challenges with regard to size but there are a whole range of social issues also which might come into play because if we do move uh, in the direction of uh, more 3D printing of buildings or walls and so on, uh, there might be significant implications in terms of jobs, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that could get into very uh, you know, complex issues which policymakers would need to confront. Well, thank you uh, for the questions and thank you, Shadul, for a fascinating talk. It's impossible to summarize something as um, open-ended <laughs> as this, other than to say possibly that uh, if I was to take a conclusion, it's that there's nothing necessarily green about the next production revolution, but equally the very fact that you can produce examples where there are significant environmental benefits means that as a society we are not in trying to meet environmental uh, boundaries and constraints, we are not condemned uh, to live with the same ways of doing things. And in fact, there are technological responses possible. So we need to bring together the environmental policies, which uh, put prices on things and put boundaries around things with uh, the, the, the technology side. And I certainly think there's a public good role. And you mentioned research in making the 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 manufacturing uh, and service uh, communities aware of the consequences because you can do an awful lot of learning by doing at the expense of society research can actually cut some of those corners so i think it's extremely interesting uh, we'll be uh, watching this we hope that our colleagues uh, in the sti directorate will be thinking about, about this in the context of their digitalization strategy, which is underway right now, and uh, watch the space. Thank you all.